Our first speaker is, of course, Dr. Murray Rothbard. Dr. Rothbard is the S.J. Hall Distinguished Professor of Economics at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He heads uh, academic affairs for the Mises Institute. He's the, no question, the most important Austrian economist uh, uh, now working, the uh, founder of modern libertarianism, uh, <coughs> obviously the most important social and philosophical thinker within libertarianism as well as economics. And he's going to talk to us tonight about egalitarianism as a revolt against nature. Dr. Rothbard. Uh, thanks a lot. It's really a pleasure to be here. I mean, we have this sort of a formal thing to say, but this case is absolutely correct. Um, this is a, it's a large uh, topic, so I'll try not to be go, go over my time. <clears throat> the, um, the first question I'm going to ask you here is why equality in the first place? This, this is something, unfortunately, I've never been able to grasp or understand. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the, standard, the, the standard approach is the, the very word equality is said caressingly and lovingly, <clears throat> and as if it's self-evidently beautiful and noble. I can't, or I can't see it. And... Uh, Maybe I'm missing a gene or something. Uh, now, equal means the same. Okay, this is what equal means. And so if, if A and B are equal in height, it means that they're, they have the same height. Uh, so therefore, genuine or complete equality, which is what the egalitarians are looking for, is total sameness, total uniformity, everybody being exactly equal, exactly the same as everybody else. This means people as identical homogeneous units. Now, it seems to me, well, the question then I ask is, what's so great about the idea of uniformity? It seems to me this, is, this goal is profoundly anti-human. It, it violates the nature of man. The glory of humanity is the difference, the differentiation, the individuality of each person, and the fact that each individual is unique and irreplaceable, which, which what makes each individual precious. I used to say that ants, this is contrast to ants, but then various etymologists accuse me of being smearing ants. But they're really different. <laughs> but anyway, you get the, you get the point. So uh, the fact that every person is diverse and individual, therefore, must mean that everybody is unequal. And uh, that's great, as far as I'm concerned. As far as I know, I can be, some of you can correct me on this, uh, no, no important philosopher or writer favored equality or anything like it until the 18th century. Uh, there's a, I found a quote from great 11th century Arab scholastic Al-Ghazali, who denounced the idea of coerced equality and sternly warned that any sharing of wealth must be voluntary. So obviously there must have been some people who were in favor of coerced equality, but I can't find any important thinkers who are for it. Uh, Adam Smith gets in one of my favorite hobby horses here, uh, and it was an 18th century environmentalist and an egalitarian in the sense that he believed every individual is equal, a uniform blob, uh, and uh, has the same interest, the same ability, the same intelligence, etc. Uh, this contrast of the scholastics, um, my favorite founders of economics in the French school in the 18th century, who believed, uh, quite the contrary, the specialization and division of labor are based on differences of ability and interest, in addition to differences in natural resources. Smith, on the other hand, being, believing everybody is the same blob, has to deny that. <clears throat> and therefore, he tried to explain exchange as, quote, uh, as, as, by the quote, alleged, an alleged, quote, propensity to truck, barter, and exchange, unquote. In other words, that people are, are simply like lemmings determined in some way to exchange, even though they don't really benefit from it. Uh, Smith also held, by the way, that differences in wages are therefore different, due only to differences in the cost of training, that everybody's really equal, an equal blob. And this, by the way, is still the, the ruling theory in neoclassical economics, including Chicago-wide economics. Gary Becker, for example, much beloved labor econ Chicago labor economist, believes that the only dif the differences in wage rates are only due to differences in training. So the only reason why architects get more money than ditch diggers because they you know, have a longer period of training. In contrast to this, San Bernardino of Siena, a great 15th century Italian scholastic Franciscan, said the differences in wages are due, in addition to the cost of training, differences in the cost of training, are due to differences in ability, energy, and interest. In other words, it's essentially San Bernardino of Siena was a better labor economist than Gary Becker. So this is one of my themes in the history of economic thought, by the way, is that there's a tremendous loss of knowledge, and in addition to growth of knowledge, there's also great losses in knowledge through history. Uh, okay, the uh, turning from why equality, the next question is equality in what? What is supposed to be equal? 
talk specifically. Well, one first, one classic uh, item is equality of, in, of income, <clears throat> and uh, this was the, sort of the, the traditional, you can call it traditionally egalitarian, post 18th century egalitarian. Everybody should have equal income. Uh, now, of course, the first thing you have to say as an economist, you can't just talk about money income. So it's meaningless. You have to talk about real income. What, what does the money buy? So there has to be an equality of real income. So when we get to that, we find in addition to e the goal of egalitarianism being monstrous and anti-human, it's also impossible. It's conceptually impossible. Because how do you e equalize everybody's real income? For example, there's location. A Hungarian is living on the banks of the Danube, dining in wonderful outside cafes. People living in the Bay Area in San Francisco are living in quasi-paradise. People, on the other hand, living in Union City, New Jersey, not too good a shape, or northern Minnesota, where they're freezing most of the time. How do you equalize these real income differences? Uh, you can't, presumably you can't bring everybody an equal part of them. Every, every month you fly them in different places. It seems to be uh, impractical. <clears throat> You can bust them. You can. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so then the other question is, you have to find out their psychic, the positive psychic incomes of living in the Bay Area, living in, uh, in Budapest, and tax them, and then subsidize the people with negative psychic incomes from living in Union City, New Jersey. Uh, that, are they, on the other hand, how do you find that out? You can't calculate. There's no way you can find that out because you certainly can't ask them because everybody will say, no, no, I'm suffering here. I have to be paid. Right? Pay me. And there are, a few, there are, of course, some people, some eccentric types who don't like the Bay Area and Bay Area prefer living in Union City, New Jersey. What do you do with them? How do you, people, how do you find out what their subjective preferences are? Obviously, you can't. Uh, so I think that's the equality of real income is in very bad conceptual shape. And by the way, I consider that utopian in the bad sense. I think it's important to differentiate between utopian in the good sense. For example, nobody should commit murder. That's, that's a, an ideal which probably won't be achieved ever, but it's at least conceptually possible. You can understand it. It's not, uh, it's not, it doesn't break down conceptually. But to say everybody should have equal real income does break down conceptually. It's impossible to even ponder it. <clears throat> Equality of opportunity is the next uh, ploy here. That sounds more moderate, but it really isn't. It's, just as, it's almost as absurd as equality of income as an ideal. How do you equalize opportunities? Okay. First, first, of course, what you have to do is to make sure that family fortunes are the same. That's unjust. It's, it's, uh, for one person to inherit more money than somebody else, therefore you wipe out. Either wipe out inheritance altogether or equalize inheritance. So if you do that, but there's still more left. Inheritance is not the first, the monetary inheritance is only the first step. What do you do about the quote unfairness unquote of the fact that people come from different families? Some 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 people are born into parents who are wise, cultured, and intelligent. Others grow up, other children grow up in broken, moronic, and dysfunctional homes. How do you equalize that? Uh, how do you deal with the quote unfairness, which is one of the great notorious egalitarian terms? It's unfair for somebody, some kid to grow up in a nice home with good parents, and so when other kids to grow up in a home with crazy parents. What, how do you equalize that? And so, of course, the classic uh, answer to that, the egalitarian answer of, by many communist theorists, is to force everybody, every kid that would grow up in a state, state nursery and state homes and state school, take them away from their parents and equalize them through state action. Except nationalize all kids from birth, in other words, and rear them in equal and identical state nurseries. But even there, even in this monstrous setup, you can't, still can't achieve equality because First of all, there's a pesky problem of location I already mentioned. There's some state nurses who be in the Bay Area, <laughs> others <laughs> in Union City, New Jersey. <laughs> How do you equalize that? <laughs> well, the wild of central Pennsylvania. <laughs> and, and apart from that, like, even the, the, the equal and uh, uniform administrators will not be the same. Some nurses and teachers will be pure evil, others will be slightly less evil. There'll be differences in... in uh, <laughs> And teachers and nurses and all the rest, and even administrators will be different. Even though the state might try, will try its best to make everybody de degrade everybody and debase them and have everybody robotic and brainwashed, there will still be differences. Looking around the fact, some, some of you have nice nurses or competent others, but you won't. There's Fletcher types. <laughs> so that, again, equal opportunity can't be achieved either. Then we come to the third category, the quality of decision-making power. Another important thing. This is, by the way, Helmut Schuck in a great book, which I recommend everybody call Envy. He's a German sociologist. He, he wrote this book in German in the 50s and was translated into English in 1961. No, 19, excuse me, 1970, and then was reprinted by Liberty Fund, I think, a few years ago. Great book. And he points out that even if egalitarians achieve their ends of 
tro- total economic equality, it will, it will intensify the other differences, the non-economic differences among people. And next step will be a drive to wipe those out, make those equal. It will intensify, for example, differences in status and prestige and, and occupation and, and hierarchy and, and decision-making power. <clears throat> so what do you do about that? What do you do about inequalities of rank? One guy's the president of a, of a corporation or an organization, and other guys are of a rank and file type. Even if they're making the same monetary incomes, they're now the difference in prestige becomes aggravated. Of course, one attempt, the, the, Marx, the original communist Marxian attempts to wipe out all, all division of labor altogether. So nobody's an architect or a, or a dish digger or whatever. Everybody's everything. And, uh, and uh, as Marx's famous quote about, you know, everybody will, will be a, 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 an artist in the morning and, a, and a, something on the uh, Artists in the afternoon and beer cattle in the evening, that sort of thing. So this obviously means everybody, if you put this into effect, everybody dies out pretty fast. There's no division of labor, there's no production, no, there's no, no longer an egalitarian problem. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to handle it, I suppose. Aside from that, apart from that more extreme uh, view, <clears throat> there's, uh, in my view, this is uh, as, a natural, as a natural law, virtually a natural law, every organization whatsoever, whether, whether it's a corporation or a volunteer organization or a uh, anything else, an ideological organization, there will always, or a bridge club, there will always be a core of people actually running it. Those who are more in, able and more interested. Or they, they're the ones that will be a core that's running it, the elite, the naturally aristocracy, if you want to call that, naturally. The other guys will be the rank and files, true in any organization. Uh, Robert Michel discovered this in his famous law of, Iron Law of Oligarchy. Michel was a social democrat in Europe in the late 19th century. And observed the Social Democratic Party in action in Germany and other countries and found out here they were committed to, to total equality and abolition of the vision of labor. Here they have a tight rule by a power elite. And, and the rank and file are listening to it. And he came to the conclusion that this if it's true of social democ- democracy, must be true of everything. They always have an iron law of oligarchy. Now, I see nothing wrong with this. It seems to me it's a law of nature. <clears throat> there will always be a core group. I know, for example, of a small but increasingly successful volunteer music organization in New York, Music Society. There's a governing board, which is elected annually uh, by its members, but for years the group has been governed by the benevolent but absolute autocratic rule of its president. There's a lady who is highly intelligent, innovative, and though employed full-time elsewhere, is is able and willing to devote an incredible amount of time and energy to this organization. So uh, several years ago, some malcontent challenged her rule, and uh, this challenge was easily beaten back, because every rational member realized that the the, the organization actually exists without her. And that's what I consider, you know, I, I consider not, not only nothing wrong with it, it's great when something like that pops up. It should be even more of them, uh, where a person, persons of this sort come to the fore and are chosen as the natural elite. <clears throat> this is the Jeffersonian natural aristocracy, so to speak. Uh, by the way, as far as I'm concerned, democratic voting uh, is at its best when, when, you, when you have shareholders of a corporation who are voting their total ownership of the assets of the corporation. If you own one-fifth of the corporation, you have one-fifth of the vote. Uh, and it's only secondarily useful in other cases as a method of displacing natural aristocrats or monarchs who go sour from time to time. Or as the in terms of change from monarchs to tyrants, if this lady sort of went bananas at some point, it's useful to have a board which will, you know, dislodge her. So at best, democratic voting is, is, is not a primary good, it's a, a, let alone a good of, its, of itself. It's simply a secondary method of, of checks on a natural aristocrat. <clears throat> Uh, during a period in the ni- mid-1960s, the new left, before it hived off into Stalinism and bizarre violence, was trying to put into effect what I think was a new political theory called participatory democracy. And it sounded great, it sounded libertarian to, the, to this extent. The idea was not just that everybody should participate equally, that was one part of it, but also that no decision should ever be made by majority rule. Majority rule is tyranny. Every decision should be made by unanimous consent of the members. Uh, it sounds very much like Jim Buchanan's unanimity rule <laughs> and public choice. Uh, a friend of mine was teaching, which remained nameless to protect the guilty, <laughs> was, te- was teaching about the history of Vietnam and the, and the new left Free University of New York in the mid-60s, which was originally a scholarly organization founded by a young socio- sociologist couple. Uh, the Free University set out to be a total participatory democracy. No majority rule, no rule at all. Everybody, every, and the members, the governing board of the Free University consisted of, of the staff, which is a couple, two people in a couple. Uh, any students who are interested in wandering in, and they pay a little small tuition, and the teachers who were unpaid, uh, and then anybody who cared to attend was part of this governing group. They made every decision equally. There was no, no priority. 
And all decisions, I mean all decisions from the courses taught to room assignments to should this room need a paint job and what color of paint should it be? I mean, every possible conceivable petty point was decided, you know, had to be decided unanimously. <laughs> well, I, I think it's a very interesting, I, I participated in a couple of these things because if I was taking the course in front of my teaching in Vietnam. And it was an interesting sociological experiment for, for Steve Ober, any sociologist here. Uh, first of all, of course, very few decisions were reached. I'm not pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, the board meeting stretched out to become life itself. It became <laughs> endless. And uh, this friend of mine would go home. It's sort of like a Sartre no-exit situation. If you left, a friend of mine, for example, would go home every day at five or six o'clock to eat and you know, live, etc. He was attacked for abandoning the, the meeting, for, for betraying the collective by leaving, by having a private life after five o'clock. Do you see what happens? The, the, it's, it's, maybe this is what the current leftist political theorists keep talking about public life and civic virtue have in mind. There's no private life anymore. Every, everything gets, gets wrapped up and tied up and mixed up in participatory, collective, virtuous, civically virtuous collective meeting, a lifelong permanent floating meeting. <laughs> Well, it should come as no surprise that the University of New York did not last very long. As a matter of fact, what first happened is the scholarship was a very good scholar, scholarly group for the first year or so, and then quickly shifts to become to teach to teach quote unquote new left astrology, tarot cards, channeling, eurythmics, whatever other nonsense was being taught at the time. The scholars all left the sociological Russian law with his work, and that was about it. The founding couple, by the way, for those who are interested in that. <clears throat> Female wound up in jail for unsuc unsuccessfully, of course, trying to blow up a bank. And while the male getting increasingly glassy eyed and a billion feet of sociological ledger domain or press digitation talked himself into the, into the notion that the only moral occupation for a revolutionary sociologist is that a radio repair man. I don't know what happened with some, uh, after that. Maybe he's engaging in radio repair work. Who knows? Uh, uh, this reminds me of new left educational theory was rampant at that time. Unfortunately, I was teaching a very conservative engineering school, which only got part, parts of this in our little uh, social science department. It's not the only part that was touched by it. Uh, the doctrine then was not so much that you have to be politically correct. The doctrine then was that the teacher-student relation was intrinsically evil because, inherent, because it's inherently unequal and hierarchical, because the teacher knows more than the student. They have to do something. They have to wipe that out. And the way you wipe that out to make it truly democratic and egalitarian is not to have any content on the course to, to sit around rapping about the student's feelings. Since the student, there's no student feeling that is any superior or you know, whatever, any, there's any, any, any greater value than any other student feeling, or the teacher's feeling for that matter, that becomes the only relevant topic to students. They sit around all the time talking about the student's feelings. Um, one problem with this, of course, was that uh, why should the students, the question which I raised immediately in our little fact of department discussion, department meeting, why should the students, or more correctly, their long-suffering parents, pay faculty who are qualified in other, you know, content? They are qualified in economics, sociology, whatever. Why should they? Why should parents pay them? Sit around rapping about the feelings of the, of the students. Anyway, that didn't seem to last too long. Now we're on to other politically correct stuff. Uh, okay, the um, and then Shook points out that even if you somehow equalize income, wealth, opportunity, decision-making power, you've still got other things. Other inequalities then become rampant, namely personal attributes. You have to eradicate them. Uh, he, uh, he, and he mentions two works, uh, which I talk about in this essay or being distributed to you, uh, two fascinating books of fictional works of dystopian fiction, one by a British writer, L.P. Hartley, called Facial Justice. Uh, written in 1961, and also he doesn't mention this. It was a short story I came across by Kurt Vonnegut called Harrison Bergeron, also published in 1961. Later published in his print in his essay, a uh, book of essays called Welcome to the Monkey House. Uh, what the uh, essentially the view is, in the case of Hartley, uh, he says uh, after World War II, he's looking at British life after World War II, and he says after the Third World War, he says justice. Justice has made great strides. Economic justice, social justice, and other forms of justice have been achieved. But there were still other areas of life that conquered, namely facial justice. Some women are prettier than others. That has to be stamped out. So there were, there were women were, were women's faces were, were grouped into three categories: alpha, pretty women; beta, pleasantly attractive, as he put it; and gamma, ugly. And then the idea is to have compulsory operations, plastic surgery operations, to reduce the 
the pretty women that are pleasantly attractive and possibly increase the ugly women. The, but the emphasis is more on reducing the, the, the faces of the of alphas to the betas. And it was the, under, the operation is undergone by the Equalization Faces Center, Equalization, equalization Faces Parenthesis parenthes Center. Uh, at the same time, Kurt Vonnegut published the Harrison Bergeron's even pithier, even more bitter, bitterly satirical story, short story about a comprehensive egalitarian society which had been achieved by the year 2081. He's writing some quoting just a couple of sentences from Vonnegut. The year was 2081. Everybody was finally equal. They weren't only equal before God and the law. They were equal every which way. Nobody was smarter than anybody else. Nobody was better looking than anybody else. Nobody was stronger or quicker than anybody else. All this equality was due to the 211th, 212th, and 213th amendments of the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> and to the unceasing vigilance of agents of the United, the United States Handicapper General. <laughs> and the handicapping worked partly as follows, quote, Hazel had a perfectly average intelligence, which meant she could, couldn't think about anything except in short bursts. And George, while his intelligence was way above normal, had a little mental, mental handicap radio in his ear. He was required by law to wear it at all times. It was tuned to a government transmitter. Every 20 minutes or so, the transmitter would send out some sharp noise to keep people like George from taking unfair advantage of their brains. <laughs> so the interesting thing about this is we feel, I think, a particular horror at, this, at these examples, at the Hartley and Monaghan example. And the reason is because these qualities are, are, are so intimately connected with each person. They're so intimately wrapped up with each person. On the other hand, we have people like the, the famous egalitarian philosopher John Rawls, who claims that people don't deserve their personal quality. That's why they didn't create them, like looks, intelligence, etc. Uh, and therefore, of course, they have to, they have to be compulsively egalitarianized. It doesn't quite go to the root of the facial justice and the, and the handicap. I don't see why not. Uh, one counter to this I would tend to make is, of course, that each person uses his or her free will, energy, and focus, and concentration to apply these given qualities to the, to the world. Uh, but Rawls says, well, that too is determined. All this energy and application is also determined. Therefore, you can't, you can't attribute any credit to that either. Well, my reply is basically, so what? It seems to me these attributes are, are mine or yours. They're wrapped up for this intimately. And what right does anyone else have to interfere with them? It means far less right, much less desert than the rest of us who have these qualities. Okay, we go on from there to the, uh, the next step, which is equality for whom? We talk about different types of equality. Uh, what we might call now classical or old-fashioned egalitarianism says that each individual should be made equal. Okay. But now we have a new, a new thing, which is even more bizarre, I think, than the previous one, even crazier. This is group equality. That's the current, uh, the current status, the current uh, craze. Groups that have been made equal to each other. In particular, there seem to be two categories of groups, those who are designated as oppressed and those who are designated as the oppressors. The purpose of social policy is to subsidize and privilege the oppressed while calumniating and burdening the oppressors. Uh, the oppressors are supposed to supply a seemingly endless flow of money, prestige, status into the hands of the oppressed, all the time feeling enormous guilt for the centuries of oppression. And by the way, there seems to be no stopping point of this, there's no end point to say, okay, here's how much you have to pay to the oppressed. It goes on, apparently goes on and on forever. Who are the oppressed groups? Actually, nobody knows. It's an interesting thing here. And it almost makes me long for the nostalgia for the old, good old days of classical Marxism. The Marxism is pretty clear. Okay? The oppressed are the proletariat, and the oppressors are the bourgeoisie and the feudal landlords, if any happen to exist. And there's a little bit of ambiguity about the petty bourgeoisie and the lumpen, but that's about it. It's sort of, you know, it's fairly good shape. <laughs> but, but, uh, but nowadays, you can, you can find new oppressed every day. There's no way of stopping it. Uh, and it takes a lot of pressure of lo for lobbying and media attention and, 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 and approval to get to get to the oppressed status. To make yourself you know, designated and recognized to be oppressed. As Joe Silbrand writes, it takes a lot of clout to be a victim. <laughs> 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 so we find, uh, for example, in the, among the op recently oppressed, we find the Smith College, distinguished. Uh, College, Massachusetts, handed out from the hand out from Office of Student Affairs a list of 10 different kinds of oppression, allegedly inflicted by making judgments about people. Making judgments itself is apparently oppression. These include heterosexism, defined as oppression of those of non-heterosexual orientations, which includes, by the way, not acknowledging their existence. That's part of oppression. And ableism, which is defined as oppression of the differently abled. Apparently, in the old days, we used to say disabled or handicapped. That's a no-no because that makes them feel oppressed. Uh, Oppression of the differently able by the temporarily able. Like the rest of us are temporarily able, right? 
also particularly relevant to Hartley and Vanagat is ageism, oppression of the young and the old by youngish and middle-aged adults, and looks, lookism or looksism, defined as the construction of a standard of beauty or attractiveness. Uh, and oppression, by the way, also consists of, not, of noticing the difference, and in this case, noticing the difference of oppression. Uh, perhaps, the, perhaps the most chilling recently created category is logism or logocentric, the tyranny of the knowledgeable and the articulate over the ignorant and the dumb. Uh, <laughs> a set of so-called feminist scholarship guidelines, I find out, by the way, that the recently, this today, the Heritage Foundation has now come out in favor of feminism being conservative. I don't know if, I don't know if I've accepted this yet. A set of feminist scholarship guidelines sponsored by the state of New Jersey for its college campuses, that's right here. <laughs> Attacks knowledge and scientific inquiry per se as being as a male, quote, rape of nature, unquote. It charges, quote, mind was male, nature was female, and knowledge was created by an act of aggression. A passive nature had to be interrogated, unclothed, penetrated, and compelled by man to reveal her secrets, unquote. <laughs> uh, and then we have oppression, of course, is also broadly defined as, as any, as acknowledging the existence of any possible superiority in any area. Because that, that's an occasion for envy. It's how much shook points that what we've done, we've done with egalitarian is an institutionalization of envy or maximization of envy avoidance. Uh, where the highest value in life is to try to make sure that all envy is always avoided. Uh, dominant literary theory of deconstructionism fiercely argues there can be no standards to judge one literary text superior to another one. At a recent conference, one political science professor referred correctly to Cheslov Miloj's book, The Captive Mind, as a classic. Another female professor declared the very word classic, quote, makes me feel oppressed, unquote. <laughs> so uh, uh, so the, and the, the focus now of all scholarship and criticism is supposed to be to avoid or to cater to any possible feelings of oppression, which means, of course, nobody ever can be considered superior or classic or anything else. Uh, Okay, the really, but you see, there are really almost an infinite number of classes or groups that could be oppressed. I'm a member, you, every one of you is a member of almost an infinite number of groups. Okay. A height group, weight group, where you live, all the rest of it, all minorities, and they all could be oppressed. I, for example, I, for example, or some luckless graduate student I can coerce into it, can do a study showing that all people have lower incomes than the haired. Okay, who knows? You can make us find out and say, aha, all people are oppressed. And their boldness. And you have a talk about the age old oppression of bold people, and why bold people should have 10,000 years of haired oppression, should be, they should be compensated for all the rest of them. Uh, okay, to go through the, quickly through the, some of the various allegedly oppressed groups. Um, the uh, women are supposed to be an oppressed minority. By the way, minorities, but oppressed are always a minority, of course. Uh, women, of course, are actually a majority, so it's kind, of, it's kind of peculiar to call women a minority. I also, I find it very difficult to figure out in what sense Jackie Kennedy Onassis has been oppressed. Uh, the um, Hispanics, I find it very difficult to figure out why, in what sense we have been oppressing Hispanics. And, uh, the, uh, and, and the only thing I can think of is because if they refuse to learn English, I don't consider that oppression. I mean, that's not a sufficient criterion for being oppressed. There's also, of course, a lot of bizarre happenings in this whole thing, including Hispanic in particular. In, in San Francisco recently, uh, there's a Hispanic quota in the fire department in San Francisco. Uh, so for people are trying to get in, into the Hispanic, Hispanic quota. I should say, by the way, that the, the whole point here, of course, is to try to get out of the burdened uh, category of the oppressor and try to join, desperately trying to join the, the, the happy category of the oppressed. You can get in on, on the Google, the goodies. So there's a Hispanic quota. Now you have to hire a certain number of Hispanics. Well, who's an Hispanic? Well, it turns out one guy was hired and then was kicked out because he wasn't really Hispanic. He was... He was Italian. <laughs> Kick out of boo, evil. Kick him out. Another one, another fire department person was not really Hispanic because he was really he was Spanish. That doesn't count. He's Spanish can't be Hispanic. <laughs> uh, Linda Chavez is not considered an Hispanic because she's not an authentic barrio Hispanic. So you have to be an authentic barrio person. There's also a question a case in Queens, New York. There's an Hispanic quota, I think, for teachers and Somebody changed his name from Robinson to Lopez and claimed he was Hispanic. <laughs> and they have to go through an intricate gene genealogical analysis. Well, we have now, by the way, genealogy is now at a high point in American life. I figure out he's not really Hispanic, really, you know, whatever. And then the, then the question is the first thing is they didn't look Hispanic. Interesting question of how to find who looks Hispanic, who doesn't. That's a can of worms right there. Uh, the, 
And then, of course, the black question. The black question, who's black? The whole, the whole, category, the whole term, by the way, is rather peculiar because uh, when I was growing up, uh, the old, elderly people I was growing up called them the colored. That was sort of the genteel way of talking. And then, and then that, got, that was considered racist. Then, it was considered, then everybody changed to Negro. That was considered racist. Then it changed to black. And now it's supposed to be African-American. I don't think it's going to go over the American masses because they're not going to too long a word for people to say African-American. At any rate, to, uh, if, if you talk about black then, if I'm going to stop there, I'm too old to learn another name now at this point. Uh, who's black and who isn't? What does black mean anyway? Now, what, what, but in what sense, for example, is, is Governor Douglas Wyler of Virginia black? It doesn't look black to me. I know several friends of mine are Italian Americans are much blacker than he is. The skin is much darker. So what is this supposed to mean? <laughs> Uh, we, and, we, and Adam Clayton Powell Jr., one of my favorite rogue congressmen in the old days, uh, was a, a black minister and black leader. Apparently, he wasn't black at all. It was an article in Newsweek, sort of a, sort of a bemused article in Newsweek saying, well, geez, a quarter Cherokee or something, not black at all. <laughs> we decided they made a career, a conscious career decision in the early days. He's going to be a black leader. What the hell? Like <laughs> and how do you deny that? That's a really black. How do you prove this? It's a, it's a, it's a very. Uh, Strange situation. It was just the other other day. It was an interesting article in the New York Times op-ed page by a light light skinned black was bitterly attacking a new movie about Thurgood Marshall. Uh, but Sidney Poitier is playing Thurgood Marshall, okay? and he's attacking. It's a terrible thing. Whites are insensitive to the real problem here because because Sidney Poitier is an ebony colored black, whereas Thurgood Marshall is a light beige colored black. It's a terrible thing. It's racist to have a dark skinned black play a light skinned black. So we can see this now. The next, the next step is coming up with a very carefully calibrated color, colorometrics. What degree of tint is, is the person allowed to play the other person? So um, we're into it. We're into a, a, lo a lovely period here. <laughs> the uh, and we we have but we have now genealogical research has reached that stage maximum, probably its greatest apex since Hitler, because trying to figure out the genealogical references of all these people. Uh, probably the the most the best example of this is. The distinguished neocon journalist Joshua Moravchik wrote an article on Commentary magazine, tried to demonstrate that Pat Buchanan is anti-Semitic, and um, he uh, and his, ba his basic major proof was this: Aha! He engaged in genealogical, brilliant genealogical research. He found out Pat Buchanan is masquerading as Irish, not really Irish at all. He's only one quarter Irish. He's half German. That, and that, that of course, proves why he's anti-Semitic. Uh, he would have done very well with a slightly different ethnic background. He would have done beautifully in. 30, Germany in the 30s. So uh, the um, then there's of course the question of compensation uh, of blacks for for, uh, for for slavery. That's a new, new thing coming up. Uh, bills were already being introduced in the Congress for compensation. It's kind of an interesting concept. Who's, first of all, why why am I supposed to compete? I mean, the various criticisms you can make of this. One is why am I supposed to compensate? Blacks for slavery. I, my, my, I was not involved in slavery as a slave master. My ancestors were not slave master. Why are we supposed to kick into this? Number one. Number two. Even if you, even if uh, you have a well, now, first and foremost, I should say what the, the idea of collective guilt is monstrous. The only guilt for anything should be the person himself and not his fifth generation descendants. There's no way which you can force another set of people to pay for somebody else's previous crimes. Uh, the uh, and even if I, even if my ancestors were slave masters, I wasn't a slave master. There are very few slave masters left in the United States, I think, at this point. I have to be about 110 years old in South Carolina, probably not left. And this person would not be able to pay the full, <laughs> full path. Uh, so uh, it seems to me that uh, that that itself would, but you know, who should pay it? Obviously, nobody seems to me nobody should pay it. The second question, who should get it? It's another interesting area. Who, who, is, deserves, who gets the allocation of the $100 billion, whatever the, the total compensation is supposed to be for slavery? Does Governor Wilder get it? He only, he's only a 100th black. He, much, why, why, he should get very little. Who gets what? Who's the, who's the authentic slave, owner, slave descendant who isn't? Gets very, would get very dicey, it seems to me. <clears throat> um, also, it seems to me, who should pay the... I don't see why the southern slave should pay any compensation. Excuse me, compensation should be paid by people who did the, the original enslavement, which happened to be African tribal chiefs. And uh, the, the Americans simply bought them from the uh, slave, from the uh, transport of them from Africa. So the compensation should be the, whoever the descendant is of King Walla 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 or whatever, and uh, try to get him to pay the $200 billion. It'd be interesting to see that too. <laughs> Submit the bill. <laughs> also, of course, if you're looking at collective 
guilt and collective punishment, there's another side of the coin, too. Shouldn't blacks pay the following, for example? Pay the victims all the muggings and the, and the, and the <laughs> and armed robberies and all the rest of it, and rapes? Shouldn't they pay all the welfare payments back? Shouldn't they pay the, uh, the uh, cost of all the privileges and, and quotas and, and set aside and et cetera, et cetera, and on and on? Shouldn't they pay transportation costs for bringing them from Africa? <laughs> plus, plus, of course, interest. So, uh, okay, I think uh, I'll end this uh, discourse by a final, final statement. I, I apologize for being personal now, because, but the new left tells me, the left tells me the personal is the political. So I, will, I, might well, I might as well fuse it and take advantage of this. I come before you, my friends, as at least a quadruply oppressed person. At least. It means I deserve at least four times whatever goodies anybody's getting. I deserve minions. Uh, aside from my being oppressed as a libertarian, because the state owes all libertarians at least a couple of trillion. <laughs> aside from that, okay, all my life, uh, my name began with R. Okay? I'm stuck, I've, been, I've been down at the end of the alphabet as the, as the goodies are being passed out, as names are being called in school or whatever. I'm at the end. I'm an R. I've been alphabetically deprived, lexicographically oppressed. <laughs> I need big compensation from all the A's, B's, and C's. Uh, secondly, I am spectacled or differently eyed. <laughs> all my life I've been called four eyed by two eyed types over there. There are lots of minions, you know, hundreds of minions for that. I represented my spectacle comrades. <laughs> Uh, third, uh, I've uh, <laughs> I've suffered all my life as a bow tie wearer. And all you foreign hand types. A few years ago, some monster, some evil person, got on television. I forget his name. He's talking talking about how to dress for success, how to dress as an executive. You know what he said? I can quote you verbatim. He said, "Don't wear a bow tie because people don't trust people who wear bow ties. <laughs> they don't trust them. I deserve minions from that guy alone." <laughs> Time massive. Why I asked you, by the way, did Senator Paul Simon do so badly when he ran for president in 1988? It's not because of ideology. All the ideology is the same. Two reasons. One, he had big ears. He was he was differently eared. <laughs> Smeared and attacked for that reason. And two, because he wore bow tie and therefore wasn't trusted because of the propaganda of the foreign handers. And fi fourth and finally, in this thing, one of my favorite topics, I've been impressed all my life as a shorty of the tall types in the world. Uh, this is the this is the evil this is the evil oppression of heightism. A friend of mine was recently saying he was trying to be parody this whole thing about it. I think, well, how about heightism? And somebody else said, yeah, it's already there. It sure is. <laughs> uh, I mean, giving sociology is a bad time tonight. But the 20 years ago, there's an article uh, written by Professor Saul Feldman, a sociologist at Case Western Reserve University, a distinguished short himself, talking about the oppression of the shorts by the tools. He brought together, he brought sociological, sociological science to this investigation. He reported that out of recent University of Pittsburgh graduating seniors, those six foot tall and taller received an average starting salary 12.4% higher than graduates under six feet. And a marketing professor at Eastern Michigan University had quizzed 140 business recruiters about their preferences between two hypothetical, equally qualified applicants for the job of salesman. One of the hypo, hypo, hypothetical salesmen was to be six foot one and the other five foot five. The recruiters answered as follows. 27% expressed a politically correct no preference. 1% okay? would hire the shorty, and no less than 72% would hire the tolly. Uh, also, he, he points out, Professor Feldman, that women notoriously prefer tall over short men. So obviously, terrible oppression right there. He could have pointed out, he failed to point out, Alan Ladd could only play the romantic lead in the old movies by standing on a box. Uh, because, because the bigoted Hollywood mo moguls who, who themselves were short, betraying their short comrades and, and, and pandering to the poor culture, <laughs> uh, made them do it. Uh, he also, Feldman also points out the language. Our language is filled with anti-short prejudice and such phrases as people being, quote, short-sighted, short-changed, <laughs> short-circuited, and short in cash. <laughs> He also adds that among two major party candidates for president, the taller was almost invariably elected. And of course, he could have pointed out that uh, the, the 1988 campaign, where not only did Bush tower over to caucus, but Representative Charles Wilson, Wilson, Democrat of Texas, was able to express the tallest bigotry of his region, quote, 
No Greek dwarf can carry his taxes. <laughs> and, he said, <laughs> and he said this without calling forth any protests or marches by organized short them. So, uh, the, uh, and it also might be instructive to study whether the savage treatment accorded the martyr Senator John Power, and his confirmation hearing is due to his alleged whatever, in order to the fact that he was extremely short. It should be investigated too. <clears throat> And we have, uh, so I, I raised the time, I think I'm, I will repeat that the, uh, we don't, most of us don't hate tall people. We recognize it's systematic, it's systemic. We shorts welcome uh, progressive guilt-ridden tolls as pro-short sympathizers and auxiliaries of the shorty movement. Uh, of course, we need 10,000 years of oppression, you know, lots of several trillion or whatever compensation. I must point out, however, that some of our younger, more militant shorts so organizations such as Short Nation and <laughs> Short Up <laughs> do hate the tolls. They're willing to be very militant about it. <clears throat> so I urge you, give us more responsible shorts, lots and lots of money, and we will, we will you know, damp on the radical shorts before they really tear it all up. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>